Good morning or afternoon. My name is John Singleton. I'm a mate of Larry Pickering's. I was. Wish you were here, mate. Don't we all? Um, I said goodbye to Larry on the Gold Coast last week and he asked me if he checked out whether I'd speak at his service, if he had one. Well, he's having one and I'm speaking. Um, I've got to go through the phases of Larry Pickering's life as I remember them. In any no particular order, I first met Larry in our early 30s. I'd just written a book when I knew everything about Australia called Rip Van Australia. And Larry agreed to do the cartoons for it. Larry did not do that. And so it became a bestseller. And Larry and I became friends, as is the Australian way. Um, Larry became, shot to fame in Australia first with the cartoons, which ran in the Financial Review, the Canberra Times originally, then the Financial Review, and later in the Australian. And they're actually an amusing look at Australia. If you want to see Australia through a humorous vein, you look at Larry Pickering's collection of his jungle cartoons, as they were now and then, of the Whitlam era, and before that the McMahon era, and then Gorton before that, right through until Fraser. And you can judge the character even of the Prime Ministers and the period by their reaction to the cartoons. Larry loved being a cartoonist. He hated being me calling them comics, which is a side issue. Malcolm Fraser loved him so much he was always there to open or introduce Larry's nude calendars, which we'll get to. On the other hand, Golf Whitlam hated them. If Larry Pickering walked into a room, Golf walked out. I remember at university in Sydney or Canberra, Larry was speaking and so was Golf. Larry walked into the room to speak and Golf walked out. That was his protest. That he just didn't get it at all, whereas Fraser did. Hawkey loved it. He particularly loved it when Larry decided to do a nude calendar once a year. A nude calendar which would have two months and it would star the famous political figures of the era or those involved in it. Hawkey loved it because Larry was very generous. It was very showed, it starred the private parts as Larry saw them of what the blokes would have or women would have at the time. Hawkey was very proud of his appendage was what he always imagined he would be like. Um, on the other hand, Fred Nile, who was having a bit of a feel of a, a female festival light person, he hated it, he hated it. Prince Charles, who had a nice raw blue ribbon tied around his appendage, he loved it and asked for the original art when he was touring Australia in that period. <laughs> God, they were funny. He's, you didn't go in it if you're a mate unless he asked. I was uh, between cooks at the time. I was, Maggie Eckhart was on the way out and Belinda Green was on the way in. He was going to do me with two dicks. <laughs> one with Maggie, one with Belinda, which in hindsight would have been funny, but at the time I said, mate, I get it, but it's not going to help. It's not really going to help. Not going to help me, why not? Look, so it is funny, but he didn't do it. That's what friends are for. He was a dangerous friend, Larry, because after he moved on from cartooning, mind you, he could do it remotely when he became a tomato farmer. He and his dad invented a tomato picking machine, which won the prize for the invention, best invention in the world. It could actually go through and pick tomatoes, which was otherwise done and is still done manually. I had a TV show at the time, and Larry used to come on regularly when I was short of a gift, short of a guest, or short of a gift. And he'd play guitar and sing, or I'd interview him, or he'd bring his dad on, and we'd talk about tomato picking. But the tomato picking machine had one fatal flaw. He, Larry bought all this land at Kalnura, and just the weekend we were going to pick the tomatoes with the tomato picking machine, the hail came, wooshka, as it does at Peach Ridge still, smashed X percent of the tomatoes, the tomato picking machine. Couldn't tell which tomatoes were smashed with hail and which ones weren't. So Larry, who's finished, he'd finished his football career, Aussie rules, not real football, at the time, he finished it by building the ref barred for life. It didn't matter to Larry because 
he was never going to play again. So the whole Woi Woi football team were there. And mates of his from Newtown, we, we came as well. And after a few hours, we realised the impossibility of the task. We picked about one acre and there was about 199 acres to go. So we gave up on picking tomatoes and we got on the grog. And during that, Larry decided to pick up all the, smash all the tomatoes, put them in the ground as fertiliser and become what he'd always wanted, a race horse trainer. Now, Larry was first... Before he was a cartoonist, before he did all those rude calendars, he was a horseman. He broke in horses in Canberra. He rode horses, he trained horses. He was before his time. He put in tracks, pre-training tracks, training tracks, a grass track, a pool. He was, became the number one trainer his first year in Gosford and Wong, his second year, his third year, every year. Look at the honour board at Gosford and Wong now. You'll see top trainer in Larry's years. Well, L Pickering, L D Pickering, L D Pickering. Gee, we had some fun. I was on the full time punt those days, and I used to talk talk back on two K Watt Yobbo. It was called Mumbleback. I don't know why. If you can't understand this, you'll understand why it was called that. Mumbleback Radio. And Larry, whenever I was crook, Larry filled in for me. And Larry's a. Uh, that's the phone going, not my fault. It's the photographer, cinematographer, not my phone. So Larry was uniquely talented as a horse trainer. His great regret when I met him last week, a couple of things, both to do with horse racing. One was Mick Dittman, if you're there, Mick, you starred. Mick Dittman was so greedy. We had rising, not rising fear. That was his number one regret, rising fear. Rising Fear came second in the Melbourne Cup the year that that Talak won it. And <laughs> Malcolm Johnson had agreed to ride it, but TJ Smith had offered him a full book of rides in, in New Sydney, so he stayed here and didn't come down to the Melbourne Cup. And Rising Fear, which was perfectly positioned, but had a very old jockey called R.D. Skelton on it, was Tommy Smith was sitting behind us and said, You won, you won, you won! He used to talk like Jerry Harvey, Tommy Smith. <laughs> so for about 20 seconds, Larry Pickering trained and John Singleton, Rising Fear had won the Melbourne Cup and after 20 seconds we realised we got beat by about that much. By it to lack, so the battling shakes, the oil shakes won it from the battlers from Dubai, beat Rising Fear. So we had 20 seconds of, it would have been fantastic too because that week Larry had spent the whole week training Rising Fear to picking up the Melbourne Cup and bound. And I said to Larry as we were going, if you spent that week training the horse, we would have won anyway. Anyway, wasn't to be. So the next year, Larry ran the horse dead. That's when Australian horses could get in the Melbourne Cup. So it would go down the weights, but still qualify. So it went down the weights, it got beat, got beat, got beat. And we were on a bottom weight. And the horse was just ready to go, except for one thing. Because it was so low in the weights, it missed a start by one. So his first reserve. His next run was the Perth Cup, two miles those days. Might be now, I don't know. But it set a world record for two miles, which would have set in the Melbourne Cup. Who's to say? That was funny, that day of the Melbourne Cup, we were naturally reflecting what could have been, always what could have been. I don't think we ever had a successful coup, but geez, we had some could have beens. And there was a group of beautiful girls sitting around. They were yummy mummies and they were taking all photographs in different gears so they could show their husbands that they'd been, they'd seen the art gallery, they'd seen the museum, they'd seen the era. But really they'd been out in the town the whole time so they had all these different outfits and they confided in Larry and me, which was pretty silly because then when they went to the toilet together, why do girls always go to the toilet together? And that, one of the things that Larry and I never, we always reflected on but we never got that. Why is that? This is before cocaine, this is, why do they always go to the toilet together? That, and why would they leave their phone there on the table, these girls, after confiding us what they'd been up to? So naturally, Larry and myself got our dicks out and took various photographs of our dicks and then put the phone back. Of course, the girls had told us that one of their husbands was going to get the photos developed. And can you imagine the next day when the husband gets all the photographs of them with the art gallery and the museum and the era and 
whatever else is classy in Melbourne, there's these strange dicks. Anyway, that would have been a great cartoon shot. That was why Rising Fear didn't want to win the Melbourne Cup. Larry's other great regret was that Mick Dittman is probably there today. Good day, Mick. That was Malcolm Johnson's fault. Miracle, why didn't you ring me back? You were supposed to ring Larry and you didn't ring me. Mick Dittman, he was supposed to ride after Lester Piggott got hurt or suspended. Mick Dittman wanted to return first class fares to Paris, not a problem. Stay where we stayed, not a problem. Then he wanted more and his wife to come, not a problem. Then he wanted to come back via Hawaii, not a problem, but stretching it. Then he wanted the 10% of any winners he would have been on from TJ's if they won. So, you know, those straw you were saying that King George sank. King George sank, here we called it, in sweet twa twa twa. That's 333 for those of you who are not educated. Biggest bill you've ever seen. Everyone from Australia or who knew where it was when King George sank said, put on 333. Biggest bill you've ever seen. Anyway, we said, no, bugger mix. So we put Greville Starkey on it. But Larry and I stood to win millions of quids. Kerry Pack was our partner, and we had 21 of the, of the 50 shares. We didn't have, we had 100 shares then because I couldn't divide 42, which was the normal, we had 50 and 50. We had 51%. And so we dropped Mick and we put on Greville Starkey, but Greville Starkey had won an arc, he knew what, his way around. He hit the no horse that ever led, won the arc when you lead into the straight. Greville Stark, he'd won an arc, so he knew the track. He went past the pacemakers to lead into the straight. We backed it at 300 to 1, 200 to 1, 100 to 1. Started favourite, beat horses like Saddler's Wells, battling little horses. And, I, and we were supposed to, I was supposed to call the race from 2KY, for 2KY, which I tried to. And Larry Pickering was supposed to, when I said, and followed by, he was supposed to, Tell me, because he's an artist, what's the yellow and white horse? I now know it was Rainbow Quest, but I was that excited we jumped just behind the pacemakers perfectly. I stood to one followed by, and Larry Pickering whispered in my ear, who gives up? And he said that awful profanity. So we just called Strawberry Road, and I went down to kill the jockey after he led, got as he went past, as he was in front, but the track was such a bog, he couldn't do it. So on his deathbed, Larry's two regrets were you, Miracle, and you, Mick, and Rising Fear generally. Then Larry, after cartoons and comics and, and calendars, he got into business. He uh, racetrack magazine and also stallions because he knew that all the studs would want to advertise their stallions and he sold that for X million dollars, I think it was three and a half million, a lot of money when we were 40. And he went back into, the, into business with that. And instead of putting it into a horse, he put it in the stock market. He was sensible this time. That was just before the first crash in 87, whenever it was. So instead of doing it all on horses, he did it very sensibly this time as a businessman on the stock market. And I think it was then that Larry decided to turn on the world and everyone was against him and a few rorts wouldn't hurt. He ran totally legal card games on the Gold Coast, booking a suite having pretend cops turn up and everyone had to pay to go. So they're totally illegal because they thought it was illegal card games, crap games. He also had computer programs where you could pay a lot of money and buy shares. And for a little bit less, you could bet on the horses and for a lot less, you could bet on the dogs. I remember once, current affair were trying to suggest it was a scam and they had people who'd lost their houses following Larry's program. He had people, he said, well, I've got people who bought houses on following the program. It depends how you follow it. So it all depends how you feel. And the full page ads when Current Affair, it was, it was at the time, called it an amazing business, Larry. He had Michael Pascoe, who was the host of Current Affair. Current Affair says, an amazing business. So that was, that caused a bit of a sensation for Larry again. He was a great golfer, played off two, but his official handicap was nine, so he could make a lot of money hustling at the golf course. He also had Pickering Post, which was, it still is a fantastic thing. I hope it keeps going forever. 
And we had Veloso who won the Sydney Cup and then Larry took over the training from Mal Barnes and everyone one other Zach. Anyway, that's by the by. Other memories, Larry's 40th. What a great time. We booked Canterbury Racetrack. We had the electric horseman. Greg Anderson, I think it was. Imagine the board of the Sydney Turf Club as they're getting in the lift, all these proper guys, their little gold badges. And in, in, in comes with them a horse. We took it up the first floor into this very nice restaurant at Canterbury, which was a racetrack then. I think it is now, but it doesn't have races. And the horse was amazing, and the horses were encouraged to bet on the humans because all the humans had to get in gate one, gate two were a barrier draw. So the humans had to race up the track at Canterbury. We had Robbie Waterhouse amongst others as the bookmakers. Probably Larry won it. Family, we discussed that the other day. Larry bagged me because Larry has 11 kids. How many you got, Singer? Eight. How many grandkids? Four. How many you got, Larry? Seven, eight. But, mate, you're finished. I'm still here. Not over yet, mate. We didn't have a bet on that. Larry was also a husband. Poor Carmen. Poor Carol. Now, Larry was a decent bloke in every way. A good dad, a great father, very proud of his kids. Even you, Jamie. Yeah, even you. <laughs> I know what you're up to, mate. I know what you're up to. He was very, he loved you, Mel. I guess I knew Mel better than any of the other kids. She was just around more when I was around. And now little Larry, little Larry, the apple of his eye. I'd go into a lot of personal stories, but I won't, because Carol's here, as you should be, Carol. And I noticed how concerned you were with Larry, his last days when we had that big drink with my son, Jack, and Larry. This is about six months ago when Larry was convinced he was going to get better. He was chain smoking, drinking red wine, and explained to me he was getting better because he'd stopped all his trip and he had one lung out, no point having the other one out. And there was more riboflavin in one packet of drum than a whole box full of cornflakes. So he had that and vitamin C, that was going to save him. But we got so drunk that Larry fell down, cut his eye open. I thought he's not going to move, he's gone, he's out for the count. But then we heard, we'll have to call the ambulance. When Larry heard ambulance, you've never seen a guy get to his feet, he was dead sober in five seconds. We took him home, threw him into Carol, and Jack and I then hit the road, went home. Good last drink, I can't imagine. Anyway, it's hard to imagine life now without Larry. It actually really is. It's no Larry Pickering, no Bill Leake. Who's going to look upon Australia with through their eyes, with humour and wit and intelligence. Larry was a cartoonist, a horseman, a father, a dad, most of all a really great bloke, a great mate. A sense of the ridiculous maybe. I think the papers have done, the newspaper and media have done themselves a disservice in their reflections on Larry's career this week. You know, they're talking about controversial. Yeah, Larry was homophobic. But does anyone ask what happened to Larry when he was in the Roman Catholic boarding school as a kid? He was a bit more anti-Roman Catholic and anti-priest than he was any other religion. Yeah, he was, uh, he wasn't anti-Islam at all. He was just very pro-Australian. And anyone who acted against the interests of Australia, he was anti-them. It didn't matter whether they were Protestant, Catholic. He was non-discriminatory. If you came here, you loved it. You're welcome. If you didn't like it, fuck off. Who can really disagree with that? He had a terrific relationship with the Aborigines, Charlie Perkins and Larry and I raced a horse called Fearless, a name which will live on, Larry. I'm going to go and register it now. And we're going to win the cup with Fearless. What a great friend. What a disguise. When Larry ran into a problem, all he had to do is, he always had that cap on to cover the fact he was naturally, he was bald. We should have told Bill Clinton about that. When he took his cap off, no one knew who he was. Fantastic. Larry, without you, mate, life's not, never going to be the same. Racing's not the same. Cartoons aren't the same. The media's not the same. Won't be the same for you 
for Carol, won't be the same for your kids, for your grandkids, for your mates. I know how close you were to Mick Dittman and Larry Olson on that golf course the last few years of your life, 10 years, 20 years. I know how much you thought that I should play golf so you could torture me around the golf course, but I already played tennis with you. One night I remember, oh, well, I don't want to remember that. But everything Larry did, he was really good at. Absolutely competitive. I'm sure if I'd, I'd taken him up on a bet that he'd outlived me, he would have. I'd be there and he'd be here. Which may not be a better thing. He was so competitive. Larry, I miss you, mate. On behalf of everyone here, your friends, family, kids, grandkids, and even those who might be tempted to come to base in your death. You didn't know what Larry was like, and those who did are going to share with me the fact that it will never be the same, mate. I miss you now, I miss you forever. See you, pal. I hope not for a while, but I'll see you. Ta-da.